welcome to the next episode of The Lair. Joining me today is one of my former classmates. I'm happy to say that she is now a colleague. There are so many things about this individual that I admire. And probably one of the most important and intriguing things is just her compassion for people. Uh, I think as a leader, if you're not compassionate and can't show empathy to those that are around you, you're, you're not going to last very long. Uh, and my guest, Alina uh, Verdian, hopefully I said it right, Alina. Yes, uh, you did. Perfect. <laughs> welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you know, you. I was always impressed with many of the conversations that we had in class, but really more, most importantly, the, the aspect of you being one of the, I will say, co-founders of our equity chats at Michigan Ross. Uh, I think it, it was Stephanie and Mika were at least two of the others, but those are the ones that I'm familiar with, at least that helped this. Uh, the equity chats, I think, were very helpful to, to all of us. Uh, but at first, I want to ask you, why did you decide to join the MBA program at Michigan? What were your goals? And did you achieve your goals? Um, hey, Dan, I'm so glad to be here. Okay, I'm a little <laughs> nervous, but let's, uh, let's get to it. So um, MBA program, uh, it goes way back, like back to 1998. And I don't want to bore you with a long story, but I'll give you like just the gist of it. So my parents immigrated in 1998 here, and I was right out of high school. And so I um, went to learn English at Washtenaw Community College, and I wanted to go to this awesome university. I lived in Ann Arbor. We moved right to Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I wanted to go to this great university that everybody talked about, the University of Michigan. Well, um, I had to take a job because we were poor back then, and my job was at the University of Michigan. But my parents told me we couldn't afford to go to University of Michigan because we just we didn't, I mean, we just didn't have money. And so uh, if you can imagine, you know, at a high school, this foreign girl who didn't speak uh, much of English and uh, wanted to go to college, but couldn't afford to go to college. So I went to Eastern, which was a great school. But in the back of my head, I always said, when I grow up and I can afford it, I want to go to University of Michigan. Well, 20 years fast forward, um, I've looked at Michigan for some time and I know I wanted to do my MBA and I wanted to go to Michigan to do my MBA because I wanted that for 20 years almost. And that was my bucket list item. I was so proud of myself when I got in because uh, who would have thought uh, to do that? And, you know, I looked at other schools too, but my, and, I, and that's exactly what I said on my admission application that I was looking at other schools, but down deep in my heart, Michigan was the place where it was just one of those really high goals that I set for myself that I wanted to do. I just couldn't get there fast enough. So that was great. So was it, uh, what did I learn? Uh, besides the uh, subject matters that we all took and learned, I think one of the most important things for me was leadership classes, especially positive leadership course. I know you've taken it too, we've taken it at the different times, but that was very um, productive, very uh, good for, for me as a leader, for, for my soul, for how I interact with my child now. Um, and then the executive coaching was something that you know, allowed me to kind of step back, understand myself and the relationships that I have and had good and bad uh, at work and personal and what triggers that and, and um, you know, how do you, how do you mitigate the conflicts if you, uh, if you have those. So did I achieve my goals? I achieved setting the foundation for my goals. Yes, but I've got huge goals. There's more to come. Um, it was well worth it. It was one of the greatest experiences. I wish more people, I wish more women would do that. Um, and I know we've talked about it in class and uh, with administration as well, is we need more female leaders to do this program. I tend to agree in terms of, you know, I, I think more people need to be leaders. And if we're going, you know, when I take a look at a company, no matter where the company exists, if the overall demographics of the company don't seem to really represent the same demographics of the community, then are they a part of the community? Uh, and, I, and I tend to kind of lean towards, no, I don't really think then they are. 
in, you know, I don't know what the makeup is in the United States. It's, it's you know, it's certainly not 50-50, but it's, you know, it's close, but we don't see that in a leadership, uh, you know, in, in the C-suites in, in most companies for some reason. And, I, and I'm not entirely sure, but I always try to promote, uh, you know, diversity of thought as much as I possibly can. And how can you, how can you have that conversation of diversity of thought if you don't have diversity in the room? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, you've, you've done all of this. You, I mean, I, I didn't know, realize that you uh, immigrated to the United States uh, yourself. I thought maybe you were born here and I know it was your, your family heritage is from another country. So now I'm even a little bit more impressed <laughs> than what I was uh, before. You know, so you've done this, you have, you had, you know, at least one hand tied behind your back and maybe they tied both of your feet together because you've you've figured out at least a formula to become successful as a woman but also as a mom how do you juggle all of those things for yourself and what advice can you give other ladies that are out there that are thinking about going back to school they're a mom they're a professional what advice can you give us and how did you juggle those things that's a great question. So my entire career, um, every coach I had said, there's got to be a work-life balance. And so for the longest time in my head, I, and I, many people think that, that balance meant you spend 20 hours on this and 20 hours on this. So it's, it's really balanced. What I've learned was that balance doesn't necessarily mean an equal balance of amount of time each day. It just means in general balance. So for example, I now have a 15 year old teenager, believe it or not. And so juggling means and balancing it out means there's gonna be a day or two or three that I'm gonna work from seven in the morning till midnight with a little bit of breaks for you know dinner or, or whatever not. But then there's gonna be a day or two that week or maybe two weeks later where I'm gonna do absolutely nothing and I'm gonna spend that time with my child or for, with whatever else that I wanted to do. So once I start understanding balance in those terms that it doesn't have to be um, everyday balance, uh, it just has to be general life balance. It helped me. And so another thing I was, I'm, I'm a proud person. And so I don't like to ask for help. And I know that it's not healthy. Um, I've learned that there's so many people in my community, um, my friends, my family who would do anything for me if I, if I only would ask them to help. And it took some time. It took a lot of years to be comfortable to ask for help. Um, so I started asking for help. I started asking, reaching out to people and saying, can you help me this? My really good friend would drive my child to school uh, every morning. She lives only a mile away from me. So she, I would get him there and then she would take him to school every morning for a year while I was in this uh, program and the kids were in the same school. So I just learned that it's okay to ask for help. And there's so many people that are willing to help. You just have to ask. Having a life partner who is on the same page with you and who is supportive, uh, it just makes a world of difference. I didn't have that at the first 10 years that I was married, but uh, I guess second time around would do better. Uh, <laughs> maybe not. So I, you know, and Emma, you think about it, they say 20 to 30 hours a week you get to, you, you're, you're studying. And um, when you look at it, you just, and everybody says, well, how, how are you going to do that? The answer is, I don't know. But I prepped myself because of um, advice that I was given is to, it's okay to say no, uh, don't feel guilty, get off all of the boards and extracurricular activities that you've had in the past, because all you're going to do is school and work. And that's all you're going to have time. But it's only for 21 months. So it all goes away. Uh, it's just a very short amount of time. And so with that in mind, um, kind of prepping to get into this 20 some months of hard work, but then it's only temporarily uh, worked for me. And children understand that, our partners understand that, our families get it. You just have to be okay asking for help and not feel guilty by saying no, which I know most women do. 
I think that's a very important lesson. And one, it's okay to say no, but asking for help. I mean, we if we're going to invest in social capital, there are other people and we have to remember that if we keep helping them, they also want the opportunity to help us in return. And if we don't give them that opportunity, they start to feel bad. And I think that's a very, very important aspect because it has to be symbiotic. And of course, you know, for me, when I, when I finally leave this <clears throat> world, I want to be able to say I gave more than I took. Absolutely. But if I don't allow people to help me at times, then they may not be so willing to ask for help when they really need it next because, oh, I've already asked Dan or I've already asked Alina for too much. I can't go back to that well again. So I never want them to feel that way. I'm so with you, Dan. I, uh, I remember just, it's funny how um, things just come full circle, but I remember when we needed help and we were on whatever government assistance. So we were taking, right? We were receiving help. Um, and I couldn't wait to for that one day where I can just give back. You know, I, it, it's my turn to do that. And I use that mentality with people. Now, I'd help anybody. Uh, you ask for anything, you know, that you're going to get whatever it is that you ask for. But I also know that a lot of my friends want to do the same thing for me. I just didn't ask in the past. And so that reciprocity and giving them the opportunity to feel good uh, is important. I, I really do believe it's important. I mean, everyone wants to feel good. I mean, that's a part, one of the things that I learned in the positive leadership class was that aspect of, you know, what would they call it? Like the reciprocity ring? Was that what it was? Yes. I can't remember if that's exact. I don't know if that's what it was called, but that's what I felt like it was. Everyone put up an Ask idea. and you shall receive. Right, right. <laughs> and I, I thought that was, that was great. Um, now, as, as, as we came closed to the EMBA program, I just need to know this. One, did you vote for me to win, most likely to win a debate with a professor? I think and, so. And why, and why did I not get most likely to have a reality TV show? Because I think this is pretty close to that. <laughs> oh, you're funny. Uh, so I don't remember who I <laughs> voted for that. I can't remember who my reality TV star was. <laughs> uh, but I definitely voted for you. Uh, and I think another person that came to mind was Erin just because of his recent, um, you know, thing with MP where, or I think it was MP, uh, where he caught a mistake or a little bubble. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so only because there was a recent event. And I mean, who remembers what happened, what happened 20 months ago? I don't. Um, I don't know. So when you started the program, do you feel like you had imposter syndrome? Oh, I still do. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you, you, you know, the last time I was in class was early 2000s and uh, you don't do this type of stuff. You, it's, it's stuff you learn in college or in uh, grade school and then it just gets put away. I have those imposter syndrome every day. I look back and say, I don't think I've learned anything or I don't think I know anything or I don't have experience in this and that and the other. Um, but then my friends and, and, and colleagues remind me that that's not the case. And so you just- Yeah. I still feel that I have imposter syndrome. Every day. I think, I think it motivates me. It keeps you learning, wanting to learn uh, more. So I've looked at another program at a different school, just, you know, <laughs> to see if I could learn more because I don't think I've learned enough or ever will. Uh, but yeah, we, we have those. And uh, do you remember the talk with Donna when she- was talking about the impression syndrome. There was a really good article that she posted as well that talks about that and how to overcome it. I don't remember the details, but I know that there was a resource available if I need to. I, I don't know that I ever want to overcome imposter syndrome. Why not? Uh, because then I wonder if it'll make me lose my edge. Oh. I like feeling like I'm the underdog. That's just, uh, you know, when, when I was growing up uh, playing baseball, uh, my dad used to say that you're going to come across people and teams that are better than you. But if you always give 100%, 100% of the time and never take a playoff, that one time they take that playoff, you're safe at first base. And then you can steal second, you might steal third, a sack fly, you're home and you can win the game one to nothing against a better opponent because they know they're better and they'll be lazy. 
And you know, Sun Tzu talks about this in, in his book, The Art of War, never spar with a weaker opponent, remove them from the battlefield immediately because you could be, essentially become lazy and make a mistake. So I don't ever wanna make a mistake. I want to be 100%, 100% of the time. And so I feel like if, if I stopped my imposter syndrome, and I don't know that I could, I think it's built into me. You know, here it is, like all, all of you all, you know, some, some great colleagues and, and, and even some of you like yourself that I consider a friend now, I look at all of your all's careers and everything you all have done in it. And I go, well, I'm just a tech guy. Oh, no, no, no. You're a tech guy with what? Five different degrees and PhD, three <clears throat> masters. And yeah. I, I can't even, I, I, I can't believe that you have all this knowledge and you still feel like <laughs> uh, you don't know. But it was that. all in technology, right? So, you know, all of you all, I come in here. And, and so this is like, I, I went to small schools um, for all of my, my computer science degrees. And now, you know, depending on which article you read, you know, Michigan Ross is a top 10 school. So like, I didn't just go to, you know, and try to build up. I went from small schools, regional to internationally known. And all of you all that were in these classes, I'm just, you know, uh, mind boggled as the, the types of people that I got to be around and, and to see and to learn from each of you. Uh, and the, the first, I don't know if we called it term or semester or whatever, I didn't really say much. I was very, in terms of you know, classes. It wasn't until our second term when, when Brian started incorrectly talking about BlackBerry. <laughs> <laughs> it just so happens to be my dissertation was in mobile security. So I know a lot about that, that market. Um, but so, so I have to add a little and then I'll let to what you said I, about being, you know, mind boggling, being around people like we have our EMBA 25 class. Um, you know, that's how I feel too. And just by talking to so many people, that's exactly how majority of the class thought is, oh my goodness, I'm here amongst all these fine people and I'm the underdog. And that's, I think, was the coolest thing about our class. Nobody, you know, everybody thought that they were uh, you know, just so blessed to be part of the such amazing, smart cohort. Uh, but we all felt like that. I don't know if that makes me feel better or worse. But... You should feel better. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as you, you know, started learning more and more at, at, at Ross, I, you know, you talked about several companies that you were looking to become advisors to. Uh, and I don't even, I don't know if you necessarily made investments in them or not, but how did you choose some of these companies? And can you talk a little bit about maybe, you know, one or, you know, two of the ones you chose to spend your time in now? So uh, one of the important lessons that I've learned in my 20 years in finance, banking, and um, actually owning my own business too, it's not necessarily the idea, it's the team behind it. Uh, and I'm sure with uh, Professor Thornhill talked about it as well in our entrepreneurial ventures class, but it's, it's the team. And so when I look at uh, companies, and I don't know why uh, they come to me, I'm not, you know, I'm not a billionaire uh, who's got a lot of cash to invest, but it's all about the team and the people behind the idea. So I've worked with a few startup companies um, and some were just, you know, a certain amount of time engagement and some turn out to be uh, a lot of fun and interesting ideas. But I look at the concept and the team behind it. And so, um, as you know, uh, I, we found this incredibly, uh, well, what makes me happy, a happy company uh, that we uh, invested in that we raised capital for. And I'm so just overwhelmed with joy of being a part of it. I can't wait till we bring one to Ann Arbor. What's, uh, can you share with us the name of the company? I could, I think I could. Uh, it's Spark Social. Uh, so okay. if you remember, we, were you in Entrepreneurial Ventures class with us? Mm -hmm. with I was. Yes. So uh, Professor Thornhill put out a slideshow on on this very company, uh, uh, it's dogs and beer. And um, I mean, dogs make our lives 
so much better and joyous and uh, that's how I went through my MBA program, Dan. I have two beautiful puppies <laughs> that kept me sane. I forgot about them for a second. And so when we, when um, I met the founder who was Emba 24, so class before us, one of the founders, we got to talk um, and we spent quite some time on the phone together, uh, just learning and just trying to understand who he is, where he comes from, what, what, what drives him. Um, it, and the concept, the fact that I love pets, it's such a huge industry. Uh, it's, we don't have anything like that in Michigan where you can actually, we're not pet friendly uh, in a way. I mean, a little bit, but not, not what, where you want to be considering how many pets uh, people own. And so it spoke to me. I thought the idea was great. It was simple. I didn't have to explain, you know, for hours what it means and how it works and the technology and software and all of these things behind it. Uh, so it was a no-brainer. I loved it. And dogs are better than cats. Well, I'm not going to say that. I like dogs <laughs> better than cats. <laughs> I like dogs better than cats. Uh, <clears throat> but we also have friends who love cats. And, and there are cat cafes. They're just not, you know, dog cafes or, or parks. Or uh, Are there cat cafes in the United States? I mean, I know it's a, like a thing in, in Asia. Oh, but we have a few in here. In the US? We okay. do have a few here. I want to say there was one in Ann Arbor, but because I don't have a cat, I wouldn't really know much about it. I just know there's not a dog park, uh, privately owned dog park with a beer bar for humans. That does not exist <laughs> here. <laughs> so it, it sounded like to me that you were saying that the, the best way to invest you know, in a company, especially if it's local, a startup, and you're going to become an advisor, is make sure it's something that makes you happy. That's for me, and I'm not, not going to claim that I'm a pro investor and advisor. I've, I've done a few companies. I've invested in a few companies. Some paid off, uh, a few didn't. But yes, if, you know, if it makes you happy and you... To be an advisor, you, I don't think you can be an advisor in a company that, you know, just blah and boring and it just doesn't speak to you. Uh, but something like that is, is fun. It's a lot of fun. I, I mean, I, I think it's important in anything that we're going to choose to spend our time with. I mean, if it's, I mean, why would we want to do something to make us miserable? But right. especially, you know, especially in our spare time because we're advising, it's almost, almost in many ways, as an advisor, it's volunteering for hopefully a future payout. You, know, but you may not see those rewards in terms of monetarily for a very long time. So at least make it be fun. Uh, make, make it be enjoyable. Make it be something that it's worth spending your time and you can learn from at the same time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, the team behind it, uh, behind any startup, uh, is, you know, I look at it and say, can I learn something here as well? It's not just, you know, it, it's great that it's fun and that's, that's phenomenal, but also what can you learn? How can I, what can I take away from me? What, what kind of experience can I go through so I can learn, so I can be better the next time around? <clears throat> that's great. You know, one of the, another thing that uh, it was always interesting, every time we talked about different companies, especially when we started getting into the, the Fortune 500, you know, okay. you always <laughs> made a comment like, you'll do anything but go to Walmart. Where did this start from? Because they're, they're the fortune one. Oh my goodness. I knew that was coming. Um, <laughs> I knew it. It'll never leave. And I think you guys are always going to remember me as that crazy student who challenged the professor on why he chose Walmart as a case study. Um, I, I guess I've earned it and I deserve it. So, <laughs> you know, I'm in finance and I've uh, managed money for private individuals, or at least I used to. Um, and so for the longest time, my clients would say, I never, you have to help me not to have a job at Walmart as a greeter when I retire. And so that became almost as a joke. And I, not that I've, so I, one day I decided that I was going to visit the store and see what my clients are referring to. And I did. And um, it wasn't, it wasn't enjoyable. It was miserable. The service was 
it just wasn't what uh, I was accustomed to or expected. And then I started reading about it. And, you know, as we've learned and, and looked at all of these um, vendors that were going out of business because, uh, you know, they were getting killed on price and, uh, you know, competitors, it just made me feel like they were not being fair to their employees. They might have been fair to their shareholders because shareholder value is the most important thing. But it just didn't seem uh, them being fair to their suppliers, to their employees, the, the pay, the, you know, and so that became my, I don't, I'd rather support, and I always do, a small business owner who sells the exact same product at a few dollars more than going and supporting, you know, a big box store that basically kills their competition, the smaller guys. And so it's funny that a city of Ann Arbor did not allow Walmart to open up. Now, and, and again, that, that I'm sure they're doing a much better job, but they we're so, I'm, I'm in the mindset of support small businesses because it's the engine for our economy uh, that I live in a city that has the same mentality. We want to support small businesses and they're very important in our community. So when Walmart wanted to build in Ann Arbor, the city said, no, uh, we can't have you here. So, but that was my, like, it's just a lot of, uh, you know, previously all these articles and, and, and uh, research that has been done to look at their suppliers and vendors and employees and what the pay is that just put a bad taste in my mouth. I hope yeah, I, I can understand now. that. So in some ways, do you think, you know, Walmart is the definition of like quantity versus quality? Yes. Yeah, so. But and, then you look at Costco, right? You look at Costco too, and that's a completely different story. Their employees get paid a, a good amount of money. They, uh, I mean, it's just, it's a complete, it's quantity as well, but it's also quality uh, and it's also fairness to the employees. So I, I think you can achieve both only if you wanted to do that. It's certainly more difficult, I think, if you're trying to achieve both. But I think when one of the things that we learned in our positive leadership class, when we went to um, Zingerman's Roadhouse from oh, Ari. Ari, yeah. It, it's about a sustainable business. And a sustainable has to sustain what's inside the community. You want to be able to give back to the employees because if the, and, and I think it, it really talks a, quite a bit to, uh, now I'm going to forget his name, the, the guy who owns Virgin, um, Richard Branson. Oh, Branson, yes. Yeah, you take care of your employees. The employees will take care of the customers. The customers then take care of the shareholders. And then therefore the shareholders take care of, you know, the executive suite. In a way. So I think that if you create a business like that, you know, I'm willing, and, and to me, I go, I'm willing to pay a couple of dollars more, but I'm not willing to pay 50% more. I don't think that's the case. I no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm had... very, very rarely <laughs> exaggerating that, that. Right, right. Uh, we had that conversation with, uh, Again, this Walmart discussion was, uh, I'll, never, I'll never be forgiven for that. And that's, I guess that's okay. But I had that same conversation with some of our classmates. And, you know, I feel like we've been uh, pretty successful and we've built our, our careers and we can afford now to support the small business. I'm not saying nobody should shop at Walmart. That is not the case. Some families have to, and that's, and that's okay. But those that could afford to support smaller guys, the, the, the family owned businesses and pay a few dollars more because we make a whole lot more then we should do that. I, I tend to agree. I, I, I would, Thank and, you. I, and, and mainly I, I don't, I mean, not, not that I said I cared like when we were going through the class, um, you know, people like Walmart makes their money because of volume inventory turnover, you know, and they were able to do that and be very precise. So like I would, if I had a company that required inventory turnover, I'd want to learn from Walmart because they do their supply chain management very, very, very well. Phenomenal, yes. But what I've learned quite a bit throughout this COVID-19, uh, you know, I'll say for myself, an experiment happens to be that companies that are local and the local food production, because I'm learning more and more how to 
maintain my immune system because if I have a, a better immune system, I have a better chance of fighting off some of these things like COVID-19. And I think it's going to happen again. This is just the first time that a, in, in our lifetime that a, a virus of this nature has made it to the continental United States. It's happened quite often in the Middle East and Africa and, mm -hmm. and Asia. So how can we do this? And taking a look at, you know, our food production and that the local, a lot of local food producers, they're not having to, to mass produce wheat, but they can do it. And, and the mass production of wheat has, is causing people to have issues with digesting. And so now I'm like, okay, well, who around us does heirloom wheat, which is, you know, the better way of making it and, or the cows, you know, are, are they, you know, the real benefit of the free range cow going on or free range chickens and, and so on and so forth. I'm like, hmm, well, the only way that can really happen is if they're local. And while I already pay a little bit more for organic beef, is it that much of a stretch to buy that same piece of beef from the local, you know, I don't say cow farmer, I don't know what they're called, we'll say cattle, cattleman, cattle rancher, I don't know, but it's not that much of a stretch. So why not just buy it from there and then take that to the butcher to, because they'll even store it for a period of time and cut it and I'm like, wow, I, it, to me, I'm going, well, I'm, I'm helping be a part of sustaining a community. You are. And I don't think That's I would have cool. thought, I don't think I would have started thinking that way if I hadn't taken that positive leadership class and start hearing RRE think, because it, it changed two, maybe 2% 2 of how I started thinking. That's awesome. Ari does a really good job and Zingerman's has been just instrumental in, in, in the Ann Arbor community and all, everything that they've given to the community was just, yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. Priceless. Well, Alina, now, now is the time where you've got to pay Dr. Ford. Okay. How much? What's next for you? I'm going to, this way it's recorded. <laughs> it, your goal <clears throat> is going to be recorded forever. What is your next goal? What is going to, what are we going to be expecting next from Alina? Oh my goodness, Dan, like next goal in the next one to two years or next goal, the big goal. Um, Whatever it is, because we're going to hold you to it. I'm going to, I'm going to try to convince you to come back on. We're going to talk about your progress yay, in that goal. Yay. Um, no, that's a good question. It's funny. I was just talking to Donna before this. We had our um, coaching career coaching session and you know, um, it's so interesting to how your mentality changes the, the older you get. And I'm not old, just saying, but something very impactful, you know, I want to do, I want my next thing has to be impactful. You know how much I care about equity and fairness and diversity and promoting uh, underprivileged, underrepresented people in the workforce. Uh, not that I've ever done it for, and, and, you know, that was part of my career, but I've always managed to find a way to promote that and, and uh, associate myself with that. So I want to do something impactful, Dan. I want to be a part of the company, whether it's a startup role or it's a, a, you know, established corporation where people matter, where communities matter, um, and where we can make a difference in, in people's lives, whatever that may be, whatever industry that may be. So that's on a career stuff. Uh, I also served on many boards before I joined. Um, I, I just did my MBA. Uh, so I go back and I look at where can I make a difference? What nonprofit organizations in my community that could use my help? That's my, those are, you know, those are little things, but big things, right? And then, um, how do I need to pull with me when I get wherever it is that I'm going? Uh, so when I come back to your show in a few years, and I want to have many bark social locations throughout the United States, that's my, <laughs> that's my fungal. Um, those are the things that you, you have to ask me a question. Did you make an impact? And how many lives did you impact? That, that would be my, you know, that's what I hold myself accountable to. I definitely will. <clears throat> I was just writing that down for the part of my notes to what I'm going to ask you and help make sure, because I think one of the ways with goals, when you, when you talk about it, you know, our friends and our colleagues and our associates, they should help us maintain the accountability to achieving those goals. Absolutely. So, I, I know you're good, you're good for it. What are your goals? What do you want to do? Oh, well, this actually, this, this show was one of them. 
I, I came up with this idea during our last class in that, you know, I, I have, you know, a pretty good amount of people that, that follow me in general. And I wanted to also be impactful, but I also wanted to continue learning and what best to learn from, you know, my friends and colleagues. And I wanted to be able to invest in my social capital and I wanted to document it. And this, class, this idea came about in our last class with Scott, which was all about social capital. And it, how am I going to get to a, so to speak, rainmaker-like status if I'm not putting myself out there and talking to people and I get to learn? And hopefully, as when, we, when I took a look at, okay, there's you and you know, let's say you have a thousand people and I have a thousand people and they get to hear it. Maybe well, there's at least you know, uh, 122 people we have in common, you know, how many other people can hear some things that we talk about? So this is part of that, that goal. Uh, and I'm going to continue because I haven't achieved it. And I, and I believe that if you set proper goals, they're iterative. And as you get closer to achieving it, you're going to change it to make it more challenging. And I, I keep learning from this, you know, I'm learning about the the lighting, I'm learning about uh, how to do search engine optimization. I'm learning about all these different ways in order to get more reach from YouTube because I wanted to learn more about those data analytics. Uh, this is helping me to learn about marketing. Uh, it's, it's helping me learn about a lot of things. And then when I have people on like yourself and, and others, I get to do a little bit of research to kind of, well, I have to be able to ask some decent questions if people are going to stay all the way to the end. <laughs> so... You know, I, it, it's helping me to, to stay on top of that. And, you know, I, I can't thank you enough. I'm very appreciative of you coming on and, and helping me maintain my own goal. And of course, if there's anything I'm able to help you with in the future, please don't hesitate to call. And I hope you will come back on sooner rather than later. I will do that. Thank you for having me. Uh, it was, I, I loved our debates in class and our chats afterwards. Uh, thanks for having me. It's, uh, I'm looking forward to our next goal checking discussion. Absolutely. Okay, everyone. Take care. Thanks for stopping by.